Well, good afternoon again. This is our final keynote today for our, to wrap up the Saturday sessions here at Manning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Shuvaloy Majumder, who is a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. Many of you, of course, know Shuvaloy from his previous incarnations as the policy director for successive uh, foreign affairs ministers here in Canada and assisted Prime Minister Stephen Harper uh, and his cabinet in navigating key issues when it comes to international security and a global economy. Uh, Shuvaloy also served um, for Senator John McCain's International Republican Institute in Iraq and Afghanistan from April 2006 to 2010. So please welcome Shuvaloy to the stage and he will be in conversation with General Rick Hillier. So I'd like to take just a few minutes, but first of all, good afternoon, welcome, bienvenue, mes amis. Uh, it is such a privilege to be back here with you this year at MNC 2019. Uh, it's a particular honor for me. More than 15 years ago, I had the privilege of organizing the very first Manning Networking Conference at the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, it was a forum uh, unafraid to challenge the established orthodoxy of the academy, of the media, and the bureaucratic elite one of which was riven by corruption of the elite set against the aspirations of ordinary taxpayers. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Uh, it was a conversation at that time about the movement and our beloved country set after the events of 9-11 and before the global recession of 20, uh, 2008. Uh, Preston, I'm not sure if you're here in the room, but you have convened our movement without fail since inception of this project. You have given us a forum to exchange ideas and better our movement. Thank you for your dedicated service, for the example you've set for all of us. We all stand on your shoulders. Uh, today we assemble to talk about our movement and the world in which we find ourselves. We are experiencing a world of strategic competition in the aftermath of this century's first wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and a massive global economic recession. In this world reorder, we are witnessing disruption across all elements of geopolitical life. When the Trudeau government took office, they proclaimed Canada was back. And in the ensuing years, what do we have to show for it? The Trudeau government clings to a postmodern concept of the world itself a borderless global community singing Kumbaya. But the world isn't postmodern. It is shaped by nation states acting on their interests. The Trudeau government has advanced virtue signaling masquerading as foreign policy, leaving Canada alone in the world with not a single friend prepared to expend their political capital in defense of our common cause. The world isn't moved by pandering to elitist sentiment. It is complex, and it requires Canada to have hard and clear interests. So simply put, the Trudeau government is leaving a legacy of grave strategic errors, errors that have forsaken our national interests, and more than ever, our movement must continue to advance a concept of what a true Canadian foreign policy can be in the face of three primary disruptions. The first is a disruption posed by hegemonic states like China, Russia, Iran, and others, who seek to upend the post-war international order and its institutions to remake a new order in their own image. The second is in the disruption posed by populism, both on the left and on the right. It is a disruption that is characterized by condescension on one side and anger on the other. And the third disruption is a role that technology plays in every element of global security and prosperity, reshaping how we build things, how we learn, how we communicate, and how we live. Last night, Karl Rove reminded us of the desperate need for conservative leadership on the world stage. He painted a picture of lives transformed when conservatives tend to the world stage, the type of leadership our movement does best, the type of leadership that served Canadians well for a decade. Prime Minister Stephen Harper challenged the Canadian establishment's take on Canadian foreign policy, standing up for Canada by drawing from the voices of our movement. Ours is a worldview where we unapologetically stand up for Canada and Canadian national interests. 
And so what are they? Security, prosperity, and values, and in that order. Advancing the security of our people and the sovereignty of our borders against all threats, foreign and domestic, remains a primary responsibility of a government. Advancing the prosperity of our people in explosive new and emerging markets across the Indo-Pacific while old and established ones like Europe begin to wane. Advancing strategic cooperation amongst democracies in a world where institutions originally designed to safeguard our values are under constant assault. As the world continues to experience transformative change, our experiences of shaping the transatlantic order of the post-war era have prepared us well for the Indo-Pacific era before us. We are both an Atlantic and a Pacific nation. We are the inheritance of political heritage of an old era and the home of a peoples who hail from the new era. And today, I'm honored to be here to host this conversation with General Rick Hillier. Born in Newfoundland and Labrador, Rick Hillier joined the Canadian forces as soon as he could, graduating from Memorial University of Newfoundland, where he recently served as chancellor and joined his first combat unit in Petawawa in October 1976. Throughout his career, Rick has had the privilege and pleasure of serving with and commanding troops from the platoon to multinational formation level within Canada, Europe, Asia, and the United States. In 2003, Rick was appointed as the commander of Canada's army, and later that year was selected as the commander of NATO's International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. Rick was promoted to general and assumed duties as the chief of the defense staff for Canada on 4th February 2005, and returned from the Canadian and retired from the Canadian forces in July 2008 after more than 35 years wearing Canada's uniform. He loved every minute of it. Rick now focuses on leadership and contribution to his country through work, leadership, and charitable endeavors to support a variety of causes, mostly centered around veterans and their families. In this conversation about the world and Canada's place in it, we could not ask for a finer guide. General, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You probably should know that uh, old retired generals are not immune to a standing ovation, so thank you very much for it here this afternoon. And, and can I say that I am, I am pleased to be here, uh, pleased to be invited to the Manning Institute and an opportunity to talk this afternoon and say, you know, here we are in this, what an awesome country we live in, do we not? Isn't this this incredible? Here we can, we can have a debate like this. We can discuss the issues of our nation. We can discuss the issues of the world. We can do it in a peaceful and secure environment. We can do it in the beautiful city of Ottawa. And we can do it for the benefit of the great nation called Canada that we know and love and call home and work and build and raise our families in. And we do it in this great hotels that have been supporting us so well. And I don't know about your room, but in my room, the towels are so thick I may not be able to get my suitcase closed when I leave here this <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. So. I'm delighted to be here and to be part of something so fundamentally good. I know it's the last talk this afternoon, and, and Shu's got some questions he wants to, uh, to ask me, and you want to get to the hospitality suite, so I'm going to, I'm a Newfoundlander, I love to talk, we're worse than the Irish, we're not on forever and ever and ever, and, and, and I'm going to discipline myself, though, on like I did several years ago at an event like this where I banged on a bit too long, and halfway through my talk, the guy in the very middle uh, of, of the audience got up and started to leave, and because he was in the center, people had to move their chairs and get up and let him out, and it was very distracting and noisy, and people were looking at him, and in fact, I was looking at him and not thinking about, not focusing on what I was saying, so I stopped my talk, and I addressed him, I said, sir, and when I spoke uh, to him directly, the room went absolutely silent, I said, sir, it's really ignorant, it's very distracting for all of us that you leave in the middle of my talk, do you absolutely have to leave right now, and I give him full credit, he stood up really straight, respectfully looked back, I think he had a little blush of embarrassment in his cheeks and said, General Hillier, I apologize, sir. He said, I do have to leave right now. I have to go for a haircut. I said, oh my God, man, couldn't you have gotten a haircut before we sat down? And he said, General Hillier, when I sat down, I did not need a haircut. So I, <laughs> <clears throat> so I just thought I'd tell you that. I'm going to discipline myself here today just a little tiny bit and try and, and get you to the hospitality speech. Get it talk to some questions from Shu, and let me just talk about a half a dozen to eight points and just say, you know, where we've been as a country and in, in the international community, in my view, and, and where we are now, and some of the things we need to get right to get where we want to be. And I, I just flash you back to almost exactly 104 years ago, uh, and, and it was April of 1915, the Canadian Division 
had just deployed in late March, early April into the uh, trench uh, lines in, in Belgium, uh, just to the east of Ypres, uh, into a quiet sector, the bulge was. The Canadians would get blooded, they would get to know what trench warfare was like, they would get some experience, and then they would play a different role after they got that experience. Expecting a quiet time, days after their arrival, they got hit by, a, by an attack from the Germans that used, for the first time in history, poison gas. The, division on, the divisions on the left, the French divisions on the left broke. The divisions on the right broke. And the Canadians, poisoned by chlorine gas, wounded, suffocating, choking, dying and dead, stood tall. The British commander, the commander of the army, said afterwards that he saw the end that day. He thought the front would break, the Germans would break through to the channel, they would occupy the rest of Belgium that they did not have. They would cut off and destroy the British expeditionary force. The French would be left alone and they would have to sue for peace. He said, we could see the end, but the Canadians stood tall. Canada stood tall. 15,000 Canadian soldiers took the highest casualty rate that we had during World War I until the very last days, the last 100 days and the pursuit to Mons. We did a, a, a documentary uh, last year called Forged in Stone to talk about Canada and how we had become a nation truly in the eyes of the world during World War I and it started on the 22nd of April 1915 at the Second Battle of Ypres with the poison gas attack. Canada stood tall and so when I hear things that we're going to Canada's back I actually get a little insulted. We've never left, right? And those hundred, those seven hundred, <laughs> those seven hundred thousand Canadians who served in World War I at such terrible cost, the 500,000 who served in World War II, those who built our nation, the greatest generation, as Tom Brokaw called that generation of World War II veterans, and those who served in the 50s and 60s and right through to the 40,000 plus Canadians who served in Afghanistan, and those who are serving now overseas, supported by diplomats and, diplomats and aid workers and civilians, they've been out there doing their thing for Canada since forever. And, and so I would just commend to you, look where we've been in the past. Canada, because of the Second Battle of Ypres, the poison gas attack, and Canada stood tall, we became a part of the negotiations leading to the Treaty of Versailles. We became a signatory on the Treaty of Versailles, and we became increasingly the independent nation that gave us the societies that we know and love and enjoy so much right now. There's where Canada was. The cost was significant, but that's what it takes if you're going to be a significant player on the international scene. And where we are now, well, maybe we are back, but I've not seen so much of it yet, right? And, I, and I'd love to see more of it. And what I see now is more of contribution as opposed to shaping events in the world. And we're content to contribute to various pieces with those pieces, pieces scattered geographically in areas that they can't be handed up to get one Schwerpunkt, as the Germans would say, to get one uh, enormous Canadian sort of uh, input. And, and so there's where we are now. And these are some of the things I think that we, we, we look at right now, and we're, we're, we're not doing it, in my view, right. But we're pretty arrogant about it. And, and you know, sometimes Canada is perceived abroad as, as holding our own hand as we walk down Lover's Lane. And, some, and that's not where we want to be, because Canada is that G7 nation. So how do we get back to the, where we want to be? And, and I say to you, first of all, we have a responsibility to, to be strong in the world. We are an independent nation. We're one of the richest nations on this earth, right? We're a founding member of NATO. We were one of the founding members of NATO following World War II, founding member of the United Nations, a seat at the table at the United Nations. And we were the lead in the resolution for responsibility to protect. So if Canada is not gonna to, to, to shape the world in our interests first and with our values second, then indeed who is going to do that for us? So here's what some of the things I would just tell you uh, before we get on to some questions. Say nothing is given to us to start with. If we want to have influence in the world, if we want to shape the world for our interests with our values, we have to work at it, at it and we have to invest in it. Nothing is given to us and to be, become that middle power that acts as the oil, the lubricant amongst the great powers of China, Russia, uh, and the United States of America, and perhaps, perhaps the EU, 
we are in a competition with many of our allies and many other nations. And Britain and France and, and Germany and Italy and, and indeed Brazil and India want to occupy those spots. And if we want to be there, if we want to be seen as a significant player who can help shape the world and what those major powers do, we have to really work at it. It's no longer a bipolar world of the Soviet Union and, and the United States of America with NATO. It's no longer a unipolar world of just the United States with Russia down the tubes. We're into a multipolar world now where the coalitions change on a daily or a weekly or a monthly or annual basis. And we've got to be agile enough and flexible enough to be able to adapt to that and shape those exactly the way we want. So we've got to earn our place out there. And if we're not investing in it, then we're not going to be able to learn. We need leadership to go out and do that. And it's not leadership that just talks about it. It's leadership that actually takes action. We heard some of that this morning. You know, bullshit walks, action talks. I believe that forever. And you can talk about things all day, but unless you take the actions necessary to invest in what you're going to do internationally, you're not going to be successful. The perception of us becomes a reality. And reality then leads and determines how much influence you have. And the perception of us internationally right now you may disagree with this, is that we're a country who cannot do anything. We're a country who can't get things done. And so if, we're think, if we think we're going to go out there and shape the world, just look at our own country. If you can't move oil, what makes you think you're going to move the international spectrum? Right? And so the perception, <clears throat> the perception is we cannot do things, and that decreases our impact and our influence on the international scene. We can't do pipelines. We can't move oil. Our acquisition process in Canada for particularly the Department of National Defense is abhorrent and it's pointless to give the Department of National Defense increased spending if you actually then tie them in a Gordian knot where you can't actually spend the money and then say, well, you actually don't need any more money because you didn't spend what you had. It becomes a downward cycle. And if we can't sort those things out ourselves as a nation, we are not going to have the influence that we want uh, in the rest of the world. Innovation in our country either appears dead to me or it appears like it is dying. And if we want somebody to, we need somebody to blow sort of some fresh air back into that decaying corpse or the dying body through those putrescent lips, it's a disgusting analogy, I know, but innovation is dead in our country. And even though we have those incredibly good ideas by these incredibly talented people, so many of them who have the ideas and take them elsewhere, often to the United States of America, to realize them as the ideas that they can execute. To our detriment, to somebody else's gain, we need actually to bring innovation to a higher level of visibility within this country, and we need to invest in how we do it, and we need to encourage people to be innovative. I was driving in Florida last week, and I drove a little town called Perry, Florida, near Tallahassee, and there's a company there I went to visit, and the street on which they have their, their, uh, their manufacturing plants and their headquarters is named Innovation Way. And that's from the county in which they are. And that county, with the assistance, the assistance of the state of Florida, with the assistance of the United States government, invest in companies who want to come there and do things that are innovative in the world to give the United States a stronger competitive advantage and therefore a chance to shape the international community even more than, more than ever before. We have to have a strategy. And right now, I'm not sure that we have any strategy or any strategy that I could actually see myself and, and, and really uh, our strategy internationally seems to be issue dependent. And I'm not sure that that's a really good thing to have. I always believe in having a vision. I believe in having a strategy. And then you shape your strategic plan to implement that strategy. And in the inside of that strategic plan, you have priorities. And priorities are the way in which people can help you realize that vision and that strategy. And as a country now, Canada appears not to have much of a strategy. And I'll just tell you, when it's issue driven like this, you can have your strategy decide it for the next decades on any single issue. And I would just commend to you that Huawei and what happens on that issue and how our nation handles it, not just the, the, the legal process right now, but the technology piece of it, how we handle that and how we respond may actually shape our place in the international community, certainly within the Five Eyes community for the next two or three decades. The Canadian Armed Forces need to be rebuilt. We need more money into them. Do I sound like Chief of Defense Staff? We need more money. <laughs> <laughs> we need more money in the Canadian Armed Forces. We need build the ability to spend that money and the right equipments and the right capabilities and the right technology, and we need more people in the Canadian Armed Forces. And if we're going to, we, I, I think that's worth applause. And we need the ability in Canada to project power around the world. 
Nothing was more frustrating than during the, the earthquake uh, uh, in uh, Louisiana in 2005 when we sent a task force of four ships down there, one Coast Guard, three Navy ships, with helicopters with all kinds of supplies and capabilities, and when we got there, we couldn't get them ashore because we don't have that kind of capability, those salt boats, these amphibious boats, and, and we need that in Canada, and we need to have the right capabilities, the right equipments, and we need to have them quickly. And the number one priority in deciding on military equipment should be, is that what the military needs, and let's get it for the military. It shouldn't be all the other things as a number one priority. Yes, they should be considered, but they're not the number one things. And let me just tell you something else, I'll be really clear. If Canada goes out and buys a fighter airplane that's anything but the F-35, we will have lost our minds and have gotten it entirely wrong. So I, I would just I would just get the big things right on the defense. <laughs> Foreign affairs needs a shot in the arm. Foreign affairs needs a shot in the arm. It's become, I believe, a bureaucratic, risk-adverse organization. I'm not sure anymore, based on the bureaucratic tangles in which they weave their incredible people, that they're getting all of the best and brightest that they would like to have. And I'm not sure that the best and brightest are indeed are staying with foreign affairs. And I think back to the, you know, decades and decades and decades ago, and you look at foreign affairs and what our nation has done, and there have been two innovative things, I believe, in my, that, that I can point to. One was in, back in 1956 when Pearson said peacekeeping was the way we'd do it. We're worked beautifully for two decades, two and a half decades. It was an innovative, incredible thing. And in 2005, we said we're going to focus on failing and failed states, and that's where Canada is going to make a difference, and we're going to help change the world in that very proactive way. Beyond that, I'm not sure that we've had anything innovative uh, in our foreign affairs uh, uh, and, and what, how we do business around the rest of the world. Uh, we need to do that. We need to attract the best and brightest. We need to untangle them from the bureaucracies in which, which come out of the Pearson building. We need to mentor them and make them into the incredible leaders. And then we need them to go forth and recruit the rest of the world to be part of Canada's sort of network for the rest of our time. We need to inspire them in a variety of ways. And, and we need to be ruthless about that. And can I tell you that my definition of ruthless is really precise. It's a woman from Newfoundland. Uh, there was a guy in my community who was dying one time, and, and, and he thought all of a sudden in his bed in his house he had died and gone to heaven because he could smell freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, his favorite. He thought this was how heaven smelled, and then he realized, no, he was still alive, still in his own bed, and the smell was coming from his house, so with his last little bit of strength, he got himself out of that bed, got himself down the corridor, hung onto the door, looking into the kitchen to keep from falling, and there right in front of him on the table were racks and racks of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies right out of the oven, thinking he could die happy now by having one. He sort of reached very slowly forward to grab one off the table right in front of him and slap went his wife across his hand and said, don't touch those, they're for the funeral. Be ruthless. <laughs> Don't get so focused on narrow niche operations like United Nations operations that you can't see where the opportunity for other pragmatic operations can take place. And don't get into niche operations which oftentimes are peripheral and don't get into them with an organization like the United Nations who has difficulty in running a one-man rush to the toilet until they improve their capabilities to run those operations. The last thing I'll tell you is this before we do some questions, is if you want to make Canada more efficient in the international world, do something really simple. Put in place a national security apparatus and a process to go with it. In our country, we do not have any way to assess what the needs are in the international scene, what parts we could bring to it, how to synchronize every part of government, whether it's Agriculture Canada or Health Canada or Foreign Affairs or Department of National Defense or the Canadian Armed Forces or CSC or CSIS or our Special Forces, how to synchronize it with Canadian objectives set to achieve and then how to work that in the international community to bring support from our friends and allies and do all of that in a synchronized, efficient manner. We simply don't have a process in place which allows us to do it. The lead department, fails. It's not workforce. We've never had a synchronicity of, of how this has been done. And when I watch the way the Americans do it with a national security apparatus, when I watch the way the Brits do it with an informal national security process, and when they can take one drop of aid, one drop of special forces, uh, some diplomatic uh, horsepower, and get an enormous value and credit for it, it's absolutely amazing to watch. And, and we look like amateurs compared to them. When I watch the Australians do exactly the same thing in an informal manner. So you know, the, the, the Prime Minister of Australia committed into Afghanistan uh, a small special forces contingent, much smaller than what we had deployed, much smaller than what we were doing in, in, in every way, shape, and form. 
He announced it in Washington. And all of a sudden, the talk in the U.S. press and the talk in the U.S. national security process was all about what Australia was doing and what incredible allies and friends they were. And wasn't the United States lucky to have them? And I looked down from the north up here in Canada and thought, my God, I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off. We were doing so much more. Put in place the national security structure. Put in place the process that works with it and make it work for our country. I'll stop right there and go sit down with you and, and talk to any questions that he might have me or you might want me to answer. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll let you get a, a quick drink of water. Um, and just before I start, I want to suggest to audience members that you can send questions for consideration by direct message to me, Shuva Loy Majumdar, S-H-U-V. Uh, and I'll take a look at that in just a few minutes and try and turn to you. Uh, General, you have given us a comprehensive statement of Canadian character. Thank you so much for it. It's fantastic. It's been a, a great journey. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you as well for your service. Uh, in times of war, you are Canada's commander. And uh, as a citizen, I know there's a lot of us who appreciate you for your service to our country. Thank you for all that. I, I wanted to talk to you first and foremost about one of your <coughs> colleagues in the military uh, and in the Canadian forces at large. There's been a big debate about Admiral Mark Norman. Um, and the circumstances that he now finds himself in presently with the government of Canada. On the heels of the SNC-Lavalin issue, there's obviously a, a question about transparency when it comes to dealing with something as serious as this. I wanted to give you the opportunity to comment both about the situation, uh, the things that he was trying to navigate through, but also your testament about what you think of the man. Well, first of all, I, I don't know anything about what is uh, the details of, of, of what the charge would entail or uh, and what the allegations are. I've not read into that. Uh, Mark Norman is a wonderful leader. Uh, he's a personal hero of mine. Uh, I, I've looked up to him uh, ever since I first got to know him because he was that kind of leader. Uh, the, the mazes that he had to navigate as the Navy uh, was trying to get into place the operational capability, which after 45 years we had failed to put into place right. as a nation for them, were absolutely incredible. Uh, doesn't matter how it happened, Davy Shipyard produced a, an oiler, refueler, replenisher, which serves the Navy to this day, allows us to do that international operational deployment, allows us to do deployment around uh, the coast of Canada for extended periods of time. Uh, so the result is incredible. I don't know if there's guilt, innocence. I'd love to see the whole story laid out. I'd love to see it all laid out tomorrow. So I, I would know the details. Mark Dorman has been an incredible leader. Like I said, he's a personal hero of mine. Uh, I would stand by him uh, anytime. I thank you for that. I wanted to turn to a contemporary issue in our hemisphere, just to kind of kick things off. We've seen the failure of socialism most manifest in Venezuela, uh, and the way in which that country has been deteriorating poses a huge risk to the hemisphere, to the global energy supply, to the people of Venezuela itself. Uh, we've seen that the Maduro regime is now starting to target its own human rights pro, uh, uh, personnel, jailing the chief of staff to the opposition leader, the, the president. Uh, recognized leader of that country. At what point do you think is a time for a humanitarian intervention supported by the military for the Venezuelan people? Uh, I, a long ways away. I would think that you're going to think intervention, uh, you've got to take a long period of time, so you're talking 10 to 20 years. It, nothing is done short term in trying to help nations recover from something that's a, f a fiasco and rebuild to something that's much, much better and do it under their, be able to continually do it then under their own power going onwards. Look what's happening in Afghanistan, look what's happening in Iraq, and you could go on. Uh, I think we're a long ways away from any contemplation of intervention myself. I think we would do initially, if we tried to intervene right now, we would make the situation worse by far. Uh, Venezuela is not an easy country to be able to operate in from any perspective. There are really no power centers, and, and, and knowing who's who and, and what's on the ground is something that we do not have in great detail. I would think we're a long ways away I appreciate from that. the intervention. Thank Humanitarian, you. we could help, but you don't force it. Oh, fair point. Um, turning to uh, the, the kind of influence that China has, in the world today, whether it's in Venezuela because of how much oil that they've bought uh, from that country at discount rates, but the kind of power it's trying to exercise around the world versus the world in which you led our armed forces. Uh, what do you think Canadians need to appreciate about the threat that China poses and the consequences for Canada in this multipolar world you referred to? Well, first of all, uh, the, the geocentric uh, parts of the world that we need to be concerned about are changing. 
have changed and are changing still. Uh, we are still very much Eurocentric. And, and despite the talk about trade with China and despite the issues with China, we are still very much Eurocentric. And our strategy has not, I don't think, taken that next step and said, okay, we need now to focus on an Asian strategy as our nation's number one priority as opposed to uh, European Union and, and Europe centric. So we haven't done that perspective. I don't think it's necessary to look at China as a threat. Uh, there are parts of China that will threaten and, and certainly uh, the intelligence, the cyber uh, uh, attacks and, 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 and those things are absolutely concerning. But China's economic power is going to overwhelm the Western Hemisphere and the rest of the world, uh, you know, in, in, a century, in, in, a, in, in decades or a century down the road here because it just keeps building, just keeps building. And you cannot go to a country in South America and not discover Chinese trade emissaries, uh, Chinese military attaches, Chinese military training teams, and indeed in many of them, Chinese equipment. Go to Africa, you find exactly the same thing. They are, they are extending daily and have a plan to continue to do that, there's no doubt, uh, their influence around the world. Trade first, uh, military as part of that, a joined up uh, effort. We could learn from them, quite frankly. Uh, we could learn from them on how to join up and be one whole of government approach here. You're not, though, advi you're, you're not admiring China's basic I am certainly though, not <laughs> admiring China's <laughs> thing there, in fact, but hey, you can learn from good and bad, right? Fair point. You can learn from good and bad. Command and control has not been a problem for the Chinese state, absolutely. No, it's not. <laughs> I, I, when you look at the relationships between China and Russia, um, it's come a long ways over the course of 100 years. Some people refer to Russia as a gas station for China at this point, having declined tremendously in its own influence in the world. But when you think about Russia's place and the way that it's been focusing on Europe, I think, in an outsized way, What's your assessment of the kind of risks that Russia poses to Canadian security, to Canadian prosperity? I mean, they are significant. Uh, and, and, and whether it's trade, not so significant, or whether it's the technological and cyber uh, areas and domains, they are significant. Or whether it is the issue of something happening accidentally in either the eastern Baltic states, uh, east of Poland, or in the Ukraine, that's, that snowballs or, or, or gets out of control. And when people start, you know, one of the lessons we learned early on was that when people start shooting each other, and when people are dying, uh, you cannot predict what will happen next. You cannot predict where things will go. So the number one threat that really you worry about, I, I, nothing keeps me awake at night, but when I wake up, I kind of think about stuff like this. Yep. It, it is an accidental uh, snowballing, multiplying of something that was designed or, or wanted to be, by Russia's perspective, a small action. Uh, you know, like some of the things that have taken place you know, on, on the fringes of the Ukraine. Something like that that gets out of control. You could find yourself in a rapidly escalating scenario that nobody can defuse. And with now multiple... Uh, formations from different nations facing each other across that sort of domain, things are going to get out of hand very quickly. Uh, you know, Putin runs Russia. I mean, he makes the decisions unilaterally. Uh, he's a risk taker, obviously, and, and, but he's a risk taker because he's assessed the leadership of the West and assessed that nobody was actually going to back, you know, stand up in front of him. And I think that's what got him a lot over the last decade or so. Uh, somebody said if Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan had been in office, uh, Putin would still be, you know, a small-time KGB operator, uh, not the president of the country interfering in operations around the world of other na nationalities. Uh, you need leadership in the West. So, hey, something gets out of hand accidentally, and the leadership part is where, you know, he has the advantage because he is a dictator. Fair point. Do you think that the adventures we've seen him have in places like Syria uh, as partners of Iran... Um, are on the wane in the face of what has been new American leadership? Or do you think that, you know, somehow Moscow controls the White House? No, well, I, I don't know if Moscow controls the White House or not, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. But, uh, you know, <laughs> Russia will take actions based on its perceived interest, not because we like it or not because we think they should do something or do something differently. Uh, they'll take actions, as do the Chinese, as does the United States of America, as should we. So we haven't been acting in our interests. We haven't defined our interest. Fair point. We have not defined our interests. We have no strategy, as I mentioned earlier, then based upon those interests being defined. And, and, and you do something for your interest in accordance with your values. And the two should work beautifully in conjunction with, with each other in a comprehensive strategy. We haven't defined the interests. We talk about the values. And we don't have a strategy. So we're lacking from that perspective. Final question. Russia, Russia will do it. They will do things based on their interests, right. and they've articulated them for themselves, at least Putin has, very clearly. 
Uh, I'll, take you, I'll take one more question with you and then turn to the audience. I'll, I'll suggest people take to the mics at, if, they have, if they have a question in mind for the general. Golan Heights. Um, do you think that Israel should be able to maintain the high ground? Well, first of all, if I were a commander, you'd have to drag me screaming and yelling off that high ground. In fact, I wouldn't leave. Uh, that's my, we, we call it in the military, vital ground for the defense of Israel against an attack from the north. That Golanites is the vital ground. Uh, and if I were the senior commanders in Israel and the prime minister of Israel, I would never give up the Golanites. I'm not sure that the United States recognizing it as, a ta as Israeli sovereign territory right now is, gonna, is a good thing or going to make things happen in a better way. It's kind of like gasoline on a fire at this stage when, when it wasn't necessary to do, I don't believe. I kind of think it was a political action where the president was kind of rescuing Netanyahu's butt from the flames of something that he was in. Uh, but if I were the Israelis, I would never give up the Golden Knights. Well, especially with Assad, IRGC, Hezbollah, Russia all vying to, to take that country, that, the, that part of that, that territory back. It's vital to their survival as a country. Fair point. Right? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I've had my fun. Now you get to have yours. Uh, I'm going to take two questions. First and second, and then allow the general to respond if that's okay. I'll start with this mic over here. Please introduce yourself, introduce yourself very briefly and keep it to a question, not a, not a comment. Uh, my name's Herman Nilsson. I'm between Calgary and Montreal right now. Uh, my question for you uh, and for the general is simply this. Donald Trump, friend or foe? And more importantly, could you kind of do a SWOT analysis as far as Donald Trump's uh, performance on the international stage? Uh, I, I don't think I have to tell any of it. Sorry, I'm going to jump right in and answer the first question. Because, you know, I'm aging. My memory is failing, so I would have forgotten it by the time I got to question two. Uh, so, look, uh, I, I don't think I have to do a SWAT for how Trump has behaved on the international scene here. Uh, here's one, one of the little things that I do get perturbed about, and I heard it here today also, is that Trump is the most unpredictable guy that we have to deal with. I think he's the most predictable president that we have ever had in the United States of America. If you want to know what he's going to do, read the damn book or listen to his campaign slogans and listen to what he says he's going to do because he's doing it all, every single thing. There's not, we, we cannot say he's unpredictable. My God. If he's unpredictable, we have not been doing our homework, right, for him. So here's, sometimes we get wrapped around the axle on Trump because our distaste for the individual for many people, with the narcissism, the egotism, and, and, and some of those things, we tend to dismiss the politics underneath it that are very real. And you know, I live in Florida, you know, I live in I have lots of friends in the States who travel back and forth, a lot of contacts in Texas, and uh, a lot of very good friends who think the world of Canada, and I, they are angry voters. They're angry voters. And so a lot of them voted for President Trump to become president. A lot of them will vote for him again. But their politics, their issues are very real, and I think we just had to remember that. But my God, he's the most predictable individual in the world. His issues internationally, so many of them are so incredibly important, but it's the way he's tackled them. So we all know that NATO set long ago the standard of 2% for each nation to contribute, and none of the nations essentially except one or two, including the United States of America, certainly not Canada, only one or two have been living up to that 2%. And the Americans have been continually frustrated by what they view as a greater percentage of the burden falling on their forces and their military and their budgets, therefore, than it actually should. And that we, uh, the Germans, others, have not done our share. He was right to bang on about that. I think absolutely correct. I think it was in, entirely appropriate. I think he should have been banging on the desk here or, or the doors here in Ottawa and saying exactly the same thing. But when he went to NATO at a memorial service where they dedicated a memorial for 3,200 NATO soldiers who died in Afghanistan, by the way, of which 159 were Canadian, he chooses that moment to launch his attack on the rest of the country. He said, you know, time and place. Have you never heard, ever heard that kind of thing? Time and place. So internationally, he made some strong points. He made some incredible inroads. The way in which he did them probably caused him to move backwards just as much as he moved, him, moved the things forward. Uh, that's, that's my assessment of what President Trump has done. Very Thank clear you. spoken. Predictables all get out. Uh, just read his book. It's all out there. Your memory seems to be just fine, General. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> General Hillier, my name is Jim Abbott. I was, uh, had the good fortune of being a member of parliament for six years at the time, particularly when you were in Afghanistan. And I just wanted to thank you for your leadership at that time as Chief of Defense Staff. I have a question for you, though. You announced just about a year ago, I think it was, about uh, there but not there 
uh, program. Uh, I was wondering what the status of it was and if you wanted to make a promotional pitch uh, for that program to this audience. Sir, Jim, thank you very much and, and, and thank you for saying the thanks. Uh, it was a labor of love for me. Uh, I never wanted to be the chief of defense staff. And if I had known as a young combat arms officer that I was going to become chief of defense staff, I would have found the nearest 40-story building and, and jumped off it right away because <laughs> that wasn't my desire. Uh, but, you know, hey, we're all pretty competitive people. And when I got asked to throw my name into the hat, hey, if I threw my name in the hat, I was going to become chief of defense staff. <laughs> it, was, it was as simple as that. I served for 35 years, three months, two days, and 14 hours as a soldier. Uh, I wore the flag of Canada on my left shoulder all of that time, and I loved every single minute of it. When I say it was a labor of love, I really do mean that. There were minutes I didn't like, and we had some tough times during what I called a decade of darkness. I heard that term mentioned here this morning, actually, called a decade of darkness during the 90s. We had some tough times when I didn't like what was happening, contemplated another profession or career, but I never stopped loving being a soldier and, and indeed serving our nation from that perspective. So, uh, so, so thank you for that. Let me uh, put in a pitch for our documentary, Forged in Stone. We, we covered five battles and how Canada became a nation during that time and what the attributes are that we, 100 years later, should be, should be taken care of now. You know, the, the leadership development, the confidence on the international scene, the ability to get things done. The troops who fought in Passchendaele, that terrible mud, the troops who fought in Passchendaele came back to Canada and there was nothing that they could not do. And so they got us through the 20s and they got us through the 30s and they got us into the 40s where the next generation took over. And so I put in a plug for Forge and Stone. Go on Facebook, YouTube, find it, like it, share it. But I'll also, there but not there, it's a great campaign. Uh, to remember those people killed, particularly during World War I. Uh, you can buy the little silhouettes of the individual soldier, the Canadian silhouette, if you will, and the money goes to charities like True Patriot Love in Canada that helps veterans and their families right now. Just go online, there but not there, you can find it. And it's an awesome, awesome program that helps people who really need help. Thank uh, Jim, for giving me that opportunity, man. Thank you. I'll pay you after, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to turn online now, General. To, we're getting a lot of questions, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to be flooded after this session, but I'm being reminded by organizers that we have about three to five minutes before we have to wrap this up. So we'll keep it quick. Uh, the first question is from Michael Binion. The question is, is there merit to Canada becoming an Arctic specialist, and is there a risk to our Arctic sovereignty if we don't? Uh, I don't think we need to be an Arctic specialist as our only specialty. I think Canada needs to develop more capabilities for the North, and I think we need to be starting with the Radar Sat 2 and those kind of uh, systems that give us the ability, because the first thing you have to know as a nation uh, before you do anything is, is what's happening. What's out there? What is the information you require? And right now, we don't have eyes across the north. We don't have eyes across the Arctic. And, and we need to develop that. We need to have better capabilities to respond across the north uh, and in the Arctic uh, throughout. We need to develop our capabilities more. We need to get more specialty skills. What we don't want to do is to let that crowd out the rest of the capabilities that we as a G7 nation should be developing to allow us to operate both at home when Canadians need us here domestically, but also around the rest of the world. We need to continue to develop those special forces. We need to continue to have fighter aircraft that can do the kind of missions we need to do around the world and at home here in Canada. And we need to have a Navy that can operate in blue waters around the world also. Mm -hmm. And we need an Army that can work with all, all of them and, and, and do it together so you get one Canadian punch or capability that goes offshore, not little pieces. Don't contribute. Go out and shape the damn world. Thank you. I might get a little emotional about that. I apologize. Question from Cindy Paul Girdwood, with apologies if I've mispronounced your name, Cindy. What is General Hillier's assessment of the mission in Mali? Hmm. Oh, now you're being diplomatic. Yeah, now I'm being diplomatic. We can't you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to uh, inadvertently affront the uh, incredible men and women, women our, our sons and daughters in uniform there, that are serving there. I, I just, I have not seen the point of Canada being in Mali. I have not had it explained clearly enough to me that I can understand that, yes, we should be there in front of any other mission around the world. So, uh, so uh, it's my ignorance that, that tells you that I can't explain it to you why Mali is, should be at the forefront of our national sort of uh, international policy. Thank you for that. Very diplomatic, <laughs> delicate answer of yours. Uh, Richard Klaus, Klagsburn. Uh, Clags Brun, apologies again with the name. Hi, could you ask General Hillier about the role Iran played in Afghanistan and what he thinks about the Trump administration's approach to Iran? Uh, Iran operates to its own, 
own interest, just as I was talking earlier, every country does, it seems like, except Canada. Uh, and Iran continually foments uh, disruption and turbulence inside of Afghanistan from the, from the West, just like Pakistan does from the Southeast. Uh, I think both countries, rather than having a stable Afghanistan that might become friendly to India and some of the other countries around there, both countries would rather have an unstable Afghanistan that they can manipulate. And I think, therefore, you see not Iran as much, although they're still thoroughly, intimately involved, but you see in Pakistan a great reluctance to help facilitate the development of a peace process and a stable Afghanistan because they don't see it as being in their national interest. And frighteningly, the more India-Pakistan escalates, uh, the more Pakistan will want to have a turbulent, unstable Afghanistan that they can manipulate. And, and so Afghanistan, for the longer term, is going to be turbulent and unstable and violent. And sadly, that's going to affect you know, the 30 to 35 million people who are just good men and women who would love to leave their lives, lead their lives without uh, the risk of being killed every single day or dragged into something they don't want to be in. Fair point. General, we've covered the gambit of world issues, and I can't thank you enough for the honor of sharing a stage with you. I'm sure the audience would like to thank you as well. Really appreciate everything you've Thank you, you ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we finish, um, just some exiting. A standing